Hello, Martin. Hello, Mark. And hello, and welcome to In the Workshop with Mark Tunley, Question and Answers. Today is the 17th of March, 2022. And Martin, you have a question for me. Boy, have I got a question oh, for you. Oh, God, go on then. This is a good one. <laughs> <coughs> Mark, why... Mm. Got my arms folded now, ready yeah, for the question. Yeah, let's get into this. Mm. Um, I mean, this could be... This could be so philosophical that it could it could mean a part one and part two, but we'll yeah. see we'll yeah, see how okay. it goes. Okay. I mean, the, the question is, I guess it's going to be quite wide. So, I mean, how? Wh- Sorry, start again. Why? Why are rods built like they're built? Yeah, that is a great question, isn't it? That is a great question. Why are they built? Why they're built? Well, yeah, it's a yeah, it's more philosophy this than. Well, I'll try to be brief because this is my theory on it as well, but it, it's got a lot of weight to it, I think. It's when you when you sort of um, deep drill into it, you'll find that you're probably quite right on this. The reason why a rod is built, first of all, a rod has to do uh, a particular job. If it can't do the job that it's intended to do, it's not going to... It might sell initially, but then people will talk about it as rubbish and blah 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 and they won't tell their mates and their mates won't buy it so it'll die very quickly so it's got to be fit for purpose okay so but but being fit for purpose you can be pretty rubbish but still fit for purpose you know i mean you could take for say for instance you need to knock a nail in okay you take pretty much any hammer you could have a small toffee hammer and eventually it'll go in you know it's fit for purpose or you could take a bloody lump hammer and smash it in too much. But there's a perfect hammer for the perfect nail with the perfect resistance of the wood that you're trying to do. There's a perfect tool for the job. So it's fit for purpose or perfectly fit for purpose. Most rods are fit for the purpose that they're designed to do. But they're not perfectly fit. So there's so the reason why they're built the way they are is because evolution takes a long long time and half the reason why that is is because one the actual manufacturers don't know any better right let me break it down and be relatively specific why have say say take a barbel rod why has a barbel rod got 10 11 plus rings on it instead of five without the tip five plus tip why has it got 10 well, because they always have had. All right. So when it's a bit weird, this. So if, for instance, you took a, I designed a barbel rod and I could design a barbel rod and the ring spacings for five rings plus tip and it would bend absolutely perfectly and load perfectly and work absolutely perfectly. In fact, it would work better than the 10 plus tip because it's lighter less affected by the rings, less flat spots, etc. And you've got to bear in mind that, remember, carp rods work with 5 plus tip absolutely perfectly. So a barbel rod and a carp rod, if you take the same action, they're exactly the same. They just have lower resistance to bending. And the carp rod has higher resistance to bending. So you can do it. But if you did it and stuck them on the tackle shop and stuck them on the racks there, People have a preconceived idea of what a barbel rod should be. So Joe Bloggs comes in, he needs a new barbel rod, he knows what his barbel rod is like, what he's previously used, and then he picks up this new barbel rod and it has hardly any rings on it and immediately says, well, that can't be right, puts it straight down and walks away. There's nobody educated in the tackle shop to educate him to this. They haven't got the time or the It's not aesthetically pleasing to the eye. It's no, No, it's not what he expects. Mm. you see what he's used to so change is met with scepticism anything new is always always approached with caution and it's an evolutionary thing okay imagine this scenario we're a caveman okay we're wandering around we, we know our fields we know our trees we know our range we know everything in the in our flora and fauna we're aware of our environment so when we see a deer that we've seen before we know that's a deer that's a science so that's a bumblebee and whatever and suddenly we see this new animal, okay, and it's really big and hairy, and it's got loads of stripes all over it. 
and immediately I think to myself, oh, I'll run up and give that a cuddle. Well, I'm dead, aren't I? It just kills me and eats me. So evolution, and I don't mean to sound funny, but evolution has, has made us view everything that's new with caution. Otherwise it kills us. It's just a normal thing. You know, you just don't go, oh, I wonder what that is. I'll go and pick it up. No, <laughs> find out what it is carefully before it kills you, you know. So we view things with that. We automatically say, if it's different from my preconceived idea or my experience of it, uh, it Red must flag. be wrong. Red flag. Red flag. It must be wrong. Yeah. We never say, oh, it must be right. So, so a manufacturer, most, most fishing rods are sold, obviously, in the tackle shop. Very, very small are sold through guys like me who make them and sell them directly to the public. <coughs> so, so the manufacturers have to manufacture a rod in a, in a similar vein to how they've always been made so that they are not met with scepticism. If you go too far, you've heard that term, before it's time. Before it's, when it was made, it was before it's time. It wasn't well received at all. But today it is. It's absolutely fine. It's considered the norm. It wasn't wrong. It was just before it's time. So because of that human nature part that I was on about. So every little step the manufacturers take in their development has to be incremental and small. They can't make quantum leaps. And there's two reasons why they can't make quantum leaps. One is because it would just be rejected, even though if it's perfectly right. And two, another reason is don't, I don't generally think that they'd know how to make the quantum leaps because the, you have to understand how most fishing rods, specifically in this scenario, are developed. And it's there's not like these gurus constantly trying to push the boundaries and develop new things at all. It is just about, you know, um, a owner of a company or a consultant going out to a factory and just making a couple of tweaks for the New Year's model. So incremental changes. So where were we going with this? What was the original question? I seem to have lost myself. Why, why, why are rods, why are rods made, made the way they're made? Because of history. Yeah. Because that's how they are. You see, if you if you suddenly invented right now, today, a barbel rod, okay, they've never existed before, so there's no preconceived ideas, they would be quite different from the barbel rods that you can buy 10 years ago. Because you're setting the template, yeah. in other words. Yeah. That's interesting. So, well, um, on, yeah. the, on the subject of barbel yeah. rods then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how would you make a barbel rod? Let's say a 12-foot barbel rod, which seems to right. me like a good length to start. Yeah. Right, how would you make a barbell? Well, again, I, as I said earlier, you could make it with five plus tip, five rings plus tip, and it would work absolutely fine. It would look wrong, just would look wrong. But call it a carp rod, and it would look absolutely fine. So, so I struggled with this, you see, because when I first of all started manufacturing barbell rods, uh, I went straight to a decent pattern, which I knew I could make work, and it was a good compromise. It was light enough, but still pleased most people and it was an eight plus tip pattern and even then you know years ago i'd still have people phone up and say mark you've missed out some rings why is there so few rings on here and that's the kind of thing you're constantly fighting it back and i used to have to quite arrogantly say i said i design others follow it was an arrogant thing to say but it's true go out and use it yeah yeah we Tell the customer think yeah we the custom builders if you've got big balls and you're prepared to do it we design stuff and then all the manufacturers follow. The stuff that I was doing 10 years ago or eight years ago, the, the Shimano's and the Corums and the whoever's and all, all the rest of it, they're catching up and doing it now. You see, so, so today the current pattern, the best pattern on a, a barbel rod, which is, I still think, the nicest compromise is a seven plus tip pattern. It's only got one ring on the butt section. It works per perfectly, it loads perfectly, it keeps everything light. And it still looks like a barbel rod. When you put it into somebody's hand, they don't immediately go, oh, there's no bloody rings on this rod. Where are the rings gone? It still looks like it's got rings. But it's so it's it's still a, you know, you could still make them better. But I think there's a point where you, you say, well, that's OK. That's how a, a template for a barbel rod should look. So and also the scale of rings like on um, on some of these feeder rods, if you look at a distance feeder rod, 
these big powerful distance feeder rods are designed for whacking a the heavy lead a real long way 100 yard plus you know these real brutish yeah 13 foot 14 foot monster sticks that they've got there and how all they've done is keep all the bloody rings exactly the same the amount of them in loads of them they just made them all bigger they're still really close to the real they just made it absolutely colossal so you've got these like 30 mil butt rings on these rods it won't be long before they're putting on bloody 40s and it's just ridiculous so on my long range feeders got stuff like that it's a 25 butt ring and it's miles up first of all and the whole thing comes down to a lot less rings just more at the tip obviously to to take the feeder tips and they cast like a dream they just you know you just they cast themselves you just launch them on where you go so again the evolution because in the tackle shop if you have one of my distance feeder rods on the rack against the other ones people go well that can't be right it hasn't got enough rings on it so they just wouldn't buy it you see but yeah that ingrained yeah kind of yeah I, I it guess looks it, looks different so it must be wrong looking at feeder rods probably a couple of rings 12 yeah. foot feeder rod you'd expect a couple of rings on the butt at least wouldn't you really? yeah yeah so yeah exactly yeah, yeah. So, you know, a lot of barbell rods are now are still are still a 12 foot barbell rod but we'll have you know three rings on the butt section I mean, jesus christ really oh yeah and that's what stifles that's why rods are built the way they are built because if you if if you evolve the rod design too quickly, it will just not sell. And I was speaking to, I won't mention his name, but I was speaking to a very, very senior executive in a massive tackle company. And we were talking about the evolution of fishing tackle and he was talking about the slow incremental stages. And he basically said this, and I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he basically said, he said, Mark, we don't have the time, money or inclination to educate people. We just sell them what they already want to buy and put money in the till. I was like, really? He said, yeah. Why wouldn't it's business? We're not into design and fishing tackle. We're into selling a product. To make selling money. people. And that's want, really what, what they want. Unfortunately, yeah, it's most of it's about. It's only the guys like me, the guys in the sheds, that do the innovation and the design work. And then everybody else catches on and rides off the back of it. You know, you take away the little people like me, the little thinkers and the little designers and stuff just stifles i mean we could be quantum leaps ahead if there were if people were a bit more brave but there is there is a change though we are more accepting of new things nowadays it just definitely does, does seem to be a, a trend you go back you go back 15 years ago and if you tried to take a one ring off a rod and change it like that i'd oh, be up in arms what are you doing you can't do that that's wrong they've got to be this way you know and nowadays, there are people are more accepting, you know. But, so, yeah. in summary, um, yeah, it's a legacy thing. Yeah, it's we're we're the prisoners of a legacy of of people who just want rods, yeah, the way they've always thought they wanted a rod. Yeah, it's human nature. Yeah. Meet, treat anything new sceptically, and because there's nobody there to educate somebody, it just sits on the shelf and gathers dust. So manufacturers can't afford to innovate too quickly because they just won't sell it. And that's part of the reason for this little series of videos, I guess. Yeah, right? a bit of education. A little bit of education. Well, I certainly feel educated. Thank you, Mark. I probably waffled Excellent. on way too much then, didn't I? But there you go. Yeah, very philosophical. Thank you. Thanks, Martin.